thanks to the Pontifical Academy for this conference. Really honored to uh, be here. Actually, I'm from Rome, but um, it's my first time here. So <laughs> thanks to John as well for leading me to this amazing place. And uh, we are obviously very proud that the president was able to be in Rome to open the new Bauhaus Festival. I think I'm gonna be saying something at the beginning that after today, I will completely change my slides and I will make the slides, I mean, not good as yours, Bjarke, but like with some external help, I will try. So I think uh, my presentation will uh, move to a very different terrain. So I hope you're gonna like stay with me because I'm gonna talk about the the need to democratize technology and the value-driven innovation and technology agenda at the EC level, and how it is important to combine the Green Deal with a digital deal, with a technology deal, that I think it can only start from people, from cities and citizens. So I will um, give some examples that are based on, so currently I'm actually leading the Italian National Innovation Fund, and I'm also in the board of the Italian um, RAI, the Italian TV. But this work is um, based on the work I've been doing as advisor to the United Nations on digital cities and the CTO of the city of Barcelona. And so it is also uh, based on the fact, I think, that I will emphasize how when we talk about technology, we don't only mean about technological solutions, but it, it is required an institutional and a socio-economic change. So we have to understand how broad it is, this transformation. And I think because we are shifting the paradigm today where we have a continuous crisis and war pandemic crisis, so we have environmental upheaval, which is also turning into a health crisis with the pandemic, which is also a social and economic crisis, and because of the war at the center of Europe, we shouldn't underestimate how even to turn the situation we're in into this kind of opportunity to redesign our society, to redesign our economic and development model with the public interest, with the common good, is a big, big um, task that we have. Also because we need to bring people with us and, uh, and we need to make it actually inclusive for a lot of people that live in a very different realities. <laughs> I wish we could all live in the uh, kind of what uh, Bjarke uh, presented us before, but the reality of many of us is absolutely different. And I wouldn't know even if Italy should be considered global north or in between global north and global south. And I think we have a lot of global south in the global north. And I think anyways, we have to understand what this means in this kind of transformation. We also, from a technological standpoint, we have a new supply shock, which is changing the, the, the geopolitical dimension of technology. I think it's gonna be more and more important because of course we have a geopolitical induced energy price shock, which is adding to extreme volatility when it comes to metal, to food. So I think we are preparing for a big food crisis where we're gonna have also an impact on migration big time and also Europe is at the very intersection of that. Uh, commodity prices, uh, which is uh, going um, crazy, I would say, in the market. And then the supply chain disruptions, in particular when we look at microchips and at raw materials like lithium at the moment and neon, uh, I mean, this is leading also to technological decoupling in a way that we have not seen before. And this is also because of the policies between the US and China, and of course now also Russia. And inside that, I think that also Europe is looking at strategic autonomy or technological sovereignty in a way that needs us to think about raw material extraction post-colonialism, supply chains in new ways. So I think it's actually a very, very important moment to uh, rethink where we are and also what is this global supply chain. So um, another reflection about technology, I mean, during the pandemics, of course, we saw that, you know, we kind of had a very fast digitization of our life. So we all talk about smart working and distance education, digitalizing medicine, and we are using digital technologies to work and to live in a very pervasive way. And now the European Commission is investing a lot of money, around 400 billions, and in the US, I think one or two trillion in digitalizing the world. 
But one thing that is very important to understand is we do not only need to accelerate digitization. I mean, we saw how this connectivity, for example, if access to connectivity has become an, a human right, and the European Parliament is talking about, okay, if healthcare, if education, if how we are living in cities, if our access to medicines depend on those infrastructures, of the, of those technology, maybe it should be considered a human right, and we have to put it in our constitution, because basically it's the access to the basic services fundamental to society. So we also need to give it a direction. And this direction is economic, I mean, sustainability, which is social, environmental, and economic sustainability. Now, I go very fast here because we had the president uh, uh, today, but Europe now is in a massive, you know, he's doing that, like something we have not seen in the European Union for 50 years. We have a joint plan, it's the next generation EU. We have a green deal, which is our agenda. And we have these two transitions that are part of where we are going uh, with mutual debt, by the way. So we are funding the next generation EU, mutualizing the European debt, and then investing in basic infrastructures for the future of our society. And I think, you know, the new European Bauhaus in this digital and green deal, it is central. Why? Because we know it's not going to happen only with low only with financial sustainability, only with investment top-down, it is not going to happen. So basically, we need this grassroots movement because we need an interdisciplinary mindset as the one we are having here, and we need to tackle it from concrete projects that at the end change the life of people. So my motto here, I know maybe not, uh, I mean, clear for everyone, but let's put people back in. We need to start people first. This is what I've done at least when I was the CTO of Barcelona. And I worked a lot, for example, on redefining. I have also Vicente here. I came after him in Barcelona. And uh, basically, our idea was we need to redefine completely what we call smartness today, the smart city, because this is not about tech-driven. It's not going to be a tech push, I'm sorry. This is going to be basically making sure that the digital and the technology work for people and the environment. So we need to start where the problems are, reducing inequalities, affordable housing, healthcare, sustainable mobility, the ecological transition, creating more green and public spaces, and reduce carbon emission. So, so if we start talking about 5G, uh, quantum, I mean, I love, we, we can get to that conversation, but if we start from blockchain, 5G, quantum, supercomputing, and for whom, and how we get their cities for whom we are designing. So I think we have to start from those actual challenges of humanities, and then we have to ask how, if we govern technologies in a democratic way, they can help us to achieve those goals. So I believe that in this, in this landscape, cities are the place where a lot of experimentation can happen. Of course, this has been said before. Cities are going to be at the frontier of this agenda. If you look at now, what are the, where are the ambitious climate plans? Where are the ambitious energy transition? Where we have decarbonization happening? actually where you know, complex systems happen, because you are also going to have to change the patterns and the social behavior of people is in cities. And we have a 100 climate neutral cities by 2030 agenda, where we're thinking about 15 minute cities or 20 minute cities, which means, <laughs> yeah, maybe in Rome it's going to be 30 or one hour, <laughs> I don't know. But at least we want to get to a point where citizens have access to basic services in their neighborhood, we stop commuting so much. We go by bicycles. We uh, kind of um, make you know, public transportation possible for everyone. And we decarbonize. We shift to electric mobility. So this, maybe Vicente, you will love this. This is the super block in Barcelona. <laughs> this is the Cerda plan, yes, which is becoming actionable today. Barcelona did something very, very ambitious, Six, reclaiming 60% of public space removing cars from the city center. Now, this is, of course, I mean, this is now, there are 16 uh, neighborhoods which are um, self-sustaining. We are super blocks, so the cars cannot enter in the center. They have to go around the blocks. And so we are getting to this kind of circular economy, net zero economy, and that's the Fab Lab, by the way, which has been started in Barcelona, thinking about 
circularity, so material, um, you know, how do you move to a bio-based material, how do you become energy sovereign, and how you become technological sovereign, giving back the streets to the residents. In this uh, kind of way of thinking, we started from the collective intelligence of citizens. So I think for me, this transformation is a matter of democracy. How do we make sure that citizens can participate in decision making? In Barcelona, 400,000 citizens took part in shaping the policy of the agenda. 70% of the proposal that became the action plan of the city came directly from citizens. And we did this with a hybrid method of offline participation in neighborhood, neighborhood by neighborhood. Not always easy, democracy is not easy, it's a process, sometimes it's big conflict you, to get there, but you, it happens. And then online democracy with a platform built in Barcelona that now is used by the European Commission for the future of Europe agenda with hundreds of thousands of citizens that are in many languages confronting on the future policy. So this is the city's coalition for digital rights. Yes, we do need standards, principles, and values. For me, this is very basic. I think that Europe, if it has a chance to put forward a new model for digitization, is going to be value-based. It's going to start actually rethinking what it means, a technology that is centered around human values, around fundamental rights, about human rights, and what it means to preserve human rights in the digital age. Uh, because we want to move away from data extractivism is another form of extractivism. If we need data to tackle all these challenges of society, we need to maybe to move away from a world where this data is um, actually monetized and manipulated and owned by very few companies, five maybe companies in the planet. Uh, by the way, they have a trillion dollar evaluation and move away from what uh, my friend and professor at Harvard uh, Jojana Zubov calls surveillance capitalism, a way like a, a paradigm where our data that we produce every day is continuously monetized and manipulated, and basically we are not autonomous. So if we want to be, have autonomy and information self-determination in this world, we have to make sure that also data becomes a public infrastructure, a common good, on top of which we can do all these actions and, and get to the standards and monitor what we do to build a better society. I'll try to be fast here. Uh, I have some. So, yeah, um, so basically the question is, and the, there is um, a person, uh, Paolo Benanti, uh, which you may know because he's also working with the Pontifical Academy, that talks a lot about this new chart for an artificial intelligence that's value-based to move away from a black box society, because what is a society where algorithmic decisions uh, based by, made by machines are taking away the space for the exercise of human values. So this is something, of course, that we need to look at the social, ethical, economic implication of artificial intelligence, and what are the implications for inclusion and inequality. Because uh, in a world where artificial intelligence can reshape how wealth and power is distributed, could discriminate the people that are most fragile and that continue to be more excluded. And I think this is obviously the case also, thinking about the global south and an economic and development agenda that could regain uh, the independence in that sense. So there is a need for an in-depth anthropological and eth ethical reflection to under understand how AI shapes trust, power, truth, and knowledge. So we need to protect human values and put human welfare at the center. And maybe, yes, we do need an alliance uh, to shape a new humanistic future. Anyway, to get practical, also in Barcelona, we created a new data deal. I'm working now with the, uh, with the United Nations and many other cities, and it's very core at the center of the digital agenda of Europe to basically a new deal on data, which means to create data spaces where we have sovereignty, individual sovereignty for citizens, which means that in a society where it's going to be digitized, of course, we cannot be citizens of Google or Amazon or Facebook. We're going to be citizens. We're going to control our data, our digital ID created data commons, and also be able to basically use data to do all these experiments and to tackle mobility, climate, housing, and all the problems that we have to solve in cities. So again, mission-oriented innovation in cities, if we use those kind of technological infrastructures, can be easier also to experiment uh, where we can go. 
So I end my uh, talk by uh, basically posing a, a big question, and I'm convinced that the Green Deal needs a democratic digital agenda to go with it, because what is the future of digital? I mean, today we have two models, and the model is basically the big tech that we are seeing from Silicon Valley. Of course, we use all of their services. It's very convenient, very hard to get away. But maybe in the long run, we don't want um, a monopoly to be running our healthcare, our education system, our cities. In particular, in Europe, there is not even one player. So we need to create a different, more open uh, society. Or do we want the big state, which is the kind of Chinese digital authoritarianism where the state is aggregating all our data and kind of controlling? <laughs> uh, no, I think we need a third way, which I've been calling big democracy. So not the big tech, not the big state, uh, big democracy. Europe is doing very well when it comes to a regulatory framework. So we are advancing a new constitution for the digital age where some laws laws are needed, and when you see this Digital Service Act, Digital Market Act, the Data Act, Artificial Intelligence Act, it seems, oh my God, a lot of laws, but there are laws that can enable us to have innovation with public values. And I think it's very important to have the right laws, so not too many laws, but the right laws that enable a next wave of innovation that's more sustainable and that puts people at the center. And uh, very quickly, in the future, I think we all want to have our digital ID. So in Europe, we are working on a digital ID system, but that's attribute-based cryptography. What it means to be different from India, so that the data, we, only, we control the data. So who is controlling the data? Not the companies, not the state, the citizen themselves. And they can decide what data they want to keep private, what data they want to share, with whom and on what terms. It's what we call attribute-based cryptography, and we give cryptography, which is a way to protect our digital ID, to everybody, and we teach cryptography in school. And then we have decentralized models, like a blockchain or a distributed ledger technology, which can enable you know, to have your ID wallet, and then we're gonna move to, of course, digital payments, maybe a digital euro, if we respect the privacy, if we have a digital ID for all European citizens, it's going to be much more kind of human-centric. Uh, so we are building this world, and we need the legislation. We need public digital infrastructures with the right regulation to do it for all the citizens. And then, of course, we also need innovation, because we need to have our own uh, companies, our own. And that, that's where the collaboration between academia, research centers, scale-ups, startups, and big industry is going to be very important. And again, Europe is investing 400 billion now in artificial intelligence, 5G, supercomputing, and quantum and cybersecurity. And actually, it's the German government that started the project Gaia X together with the French government to set standards for data security and interoperability, which is going to be very important to make this happen. I, of course, if we do not invest in uh, skills and good jobs in the age of AI and automation, we are not gonna bring people with us. And also we need to have technology and science education for youth inclusion, create good employment. Uh, we're, I'm working a lot with the, um, at the EU level on algorithmic regulation for the platform workers, which have basically no rights. So we need to have good, good jobs with um, protection of workers also in the digital economy. And then gender equality. And let me say that we are very far from that. I mean, we have a kind of 20, 30% of the participation of women in STEM and women in engineering, mathematical, and science. In Italy, is even below, I think, like even below than 20%. So we need to make visible the talent and the possibility of women to be absolutely fully shaping this digital world. So I end by saying that, yes, I'm basically advocating for a world beyond big tech and big state, which is going to be big democracy. And in Europe now, we have the possibility, together with the Green Deal, to advance this agenda, which is a new humanism in the digital age, giving central importance to civil liberty, individual privacy, and the functioning of our democracy. And this is the new social contract that we need in the digital society where basically the idea of digital sovereignty means that as a society, we should be able to set the direction of technological progress and put technology and data at the service of people, human values, society, and the ecological transition. 
not just the vision, but through this kind of uh, projects, make it real, concrete, working with communities globally. So I'm, I'm very eager to engage in a conversation of how do we bring this beyond Europe and much beyond Europe. Thank you. Um, we take some, a few comments. Um, Luciante and uh, John and Kate. So much for this uh, wonderful presentation. Um, I want to just focus for a minute on something you said early on in your talk, which is that for you, uh, you know, Europe, the global south is in the global north. Um, and that sort of helped me to frame this um, question, which is really about, you know, who does the new European Bauhaus represent? And when you're talking about um, data that is not black box. Um, how how then do these nuances of you know who is um, who's European, who's not, um, who's you know who's a migrant, who's a citizen, what is diaspora? All of these questions, uh, which maybe tie into your very last remark about you know how how does this become really go beyond Europe um, in a non-colonial way? Um, would be just wonderful to hear your thoughts on that. So somebody, yeah, right. So the screen, if somebody else is actually still having pushed the button there, so you may have uh, sort of uh, already concluded. No, um, so the question asked just before deserves, of course, a longer answer, but I, I have three quick remarks. The first one is on gender equality. Actually, I have taken part in many meetings of the Pontifical Academy. Now I counted in the room we have 21 men and 17 women. It's changing all the time, so almost equality here, which is very unusual for the Pontifical Academy. So the first thing, uh, can tick it off. Uh, the second is, uh, I'm really overwhelmed by the richness and the depth and the, the, the creativity of the contributions here. Uh, so uh, I, I'm just thinking about as one of the co-organizers, but we should at least put together a book on that, uh, which is available digitally as well as in physical reality, because it really deserves. Uh, these are so important contributions, uh, so diverse, and we should definitely think about it. We'll discuss it tomorrow in the afternoon, actually, uh, as one of the major outcomes. The third is a concrete question, uh, because, Francesca, uh, what do you do in, what do you see in, in Barcelona, for example, the super blocks? Uh, that's the idea to refragment, in a way, uh, to re sort of localize and maybe even deglobalize uh, the current reality, because globalization more or less meant that we have a universal metabolism, industrial metabolism. Uh, you, you extract something here when you ship it to another continent, you, you make something out of it, you sell it in a third continent and so on. Uh, that's what globalization means. It can only be done with a tremendous amount of fossil fuels input and a lot of waste, which is congesting the planet in the end. So in a way, to think of re-globalizing whatever. And the question is whether polycentricity, which is one of my favorite issues, actually, uh, can be revived, actually, with uh, organization of cities and settlements at all scales, small scale, medium scale, big scale, with a lot of metabolic decoupling, actually. But we have a unique opportunity we never had before. We have uh, digitalization. We can all live in a universal cultural space. We can all communicate with other. But we do not have to uh, extend uh, metabolic flows of energy and material across the entire planet. So. In the history of humankind, polycentric uh, communities were always the most productive. Uh, so ancient, classic antiquity, for example, Mes Met uh, Mesopotamian cities, uh, 
uh, Tus Tuscany, so to speak, and so on. Uh, will we see, I don't think, I don't know what you think about it, will we see a revival of polycentricity at all scale, not just in Barcelona, but with a universal background provided by digital, I think. So that's my question. Right, yeah, thank you for the question. So the first question, very difficult. I mean, very difficult because, um, I mean, I think we have to first be aware of the potential discriminatory use of technologies, for example, when it comes to controlling, uh, you know, for, for securitarian reasons. So when you say like controlling migrants or discriminating based on gender, based on race, based on your socioeconomic background, based on where you're from, and maybe, you know, this idea of citizenship being exclusive instead of inclusive. So yes, so this is this is a big a, a big problem. And I tried all the time when I worked with the European Commission, which many time uh, many years advising their technology policy, uh, to move a bit away from that kind of securitarian um, approach. Yes, and try to um, to be as inclusive as possible in the idea of citizenship. Yes, in particular when we're going to roll out uh, digital means to, you know, to recognize people and. Uh, for example, I mean, now in the Artificial Intelligence Act in the European Union, they're looking very carefully at, you know, facial recognition and how this is using border control and all these kind of things. And I think ah, it's going to be maybe even a ban on those kind of technologies. This is possible if the parliament will legislate like that. And I think with technology, it's always you have to be in this balance where you don't want to overregulate or regulate wrongly. You want to leave experimentation open. So we are doing sandboxes and all these kind of things. But then at the end, you want to decide what is possible within a, you know, within a society. But broadly, I think it's a great opportunity that this framework that I outlined that is now European can be expanded, replicated, for example, the GDPR, the governance on data protection. I think it's becoming the e-privacy law de facto globally. So yes, it should be replicated, it should be adopted, and it should be part of you know, how we think about that. And yes, Europe has to be always, um, I think, very aware of mo moving to this kind of post-colonial um, you know, mindset. Also, when we look now at this new geopolitical dimension with autonomy and access to, you know, um, raw materials and what we need now that we are transitioning our economy into a more sustainable and, um, yeah, uh, zero carbon economy. So, and to uh, the, uh, your question, well, as you know, also here in Italy, I'm working with Stefano Boeri, which is a big fan of this vision of polycentricity and thinking about ar archipelagos and how to connect the, the, the Borghis with the internal areas, area interne of Italy, because we have these mountains cutting across um, uh, our uh, nation, and so it's very hard. Some places are not connected at all, so we are doing a big, big push when it comes to connectivity. But also our um, recovery plan is very based on regeneration of this small borghi. So rethinking how to reactivate life in the small town, in the small cities, and then by connecting them, also pushing people a bit away from the most populated centers, from the big cities, and then try with remote working to adapt to a new, a new way of working and living. So I think there is a lot this kind of vision. And I'm not sure this is so generalizable, but definitely we're looking at, you know, also emptying out uh, office blocks in big in big cities. I mean, we are really looking at this kind of um, of dynamic happening. And then with Rem Kulhas, that will be in, uh, with me tomorrow in uh, in Brussels. Of course, he's always talking about uh, smart countryside, not smart cities. I mean, he doesn't like smart cities at all. So now we are also looking at projects that go in this direction. So. I think that it, it is a possibility. And I mean, they were even discussing it now in, in Davos, you know, another way of globalization, re, I mean, reshoring some of it um, and rethinking all the supply chain. So I think it's, it's very important to do that now. Yeah. Two more, two more comments, Kate and Monica. And maybe we take those together. Yeah, yeah. 
Thank you, uh, and Francesca, th thank you very much. Um, the a lot of what you're saying there really resonates with the organization that we that I represent, the New Design Congress. We see uh, all forms of digital infrastructure as expressions of power, whether it's entrenchment or the desire for new forms of power, yet democratic, authoritarian, whatever. The having said that, though, one of the concerns that I've had that I've realized throughout my career, I started in 2014 working on Signal, the secure messaging app as a designer, which may I um, remind everybody is currently trying to be banned somewhat in Brussels right now. Um, and the what I've seen is I had a belief, a, a concrete belief in this idea of digitization, privacy, and security as a basis for a democratic system. I've also seen this as part of why I live in Berlin, the, the framework um, you know, is one of a dozen different manifestations of this desire for liberty and democracy through a shared commons. And Berlin, for example, has this in, in tremendous amounts. What I've seen, though, is two weeks ago in Australia, the National Disability Insurance Scheme suffered a major hack, which resulted in the, the leaking of hundreds of thousands of um, medical, private medical records. Australia itself is a digitized nation not under the same kinds of values that we've talked about here today. Um, having said that, this comes off the back of, of course, um, the, the broader, if you see what happens when things truly break down, for example, uh, the amount of material that's just leaking like a sieve from Russia, both in the public sector and from private companies. My question is, how do we account collectively for the messiness, I guess, that's inherent in what it essentially is a new vision built on very flawed Silicon Valley ideology. Um, how do we how do we build the mechanisms, in your perspective, to reject the worst parts of that digitization, and then bring the things that we want so that that can come through completely through with the kinds of values that we're talking about here today. Um, <clears throat> I I just have one uh, question about the digital literacy gap. Um, I, I picture this as uh, Europe-centric, but if you go see um, uh, an area in Indonesia uh, or in other places in the south where probably only 10% of the area has internet access, um, then in most of the places that we work with, probably has 10% internet access. And you know, there goes data, their data, their uh, financial data, their uh, uh, basic uh, access to government services not available. Yeah. Yeah, I think they're, they're a bit connected uh, to questions, so I'll be, um, I think, brief. Anyway, those questions require, of course, a much uh, broader explanation, but I think. Um, I start from the last one. I think that's why I'm stressing. I, I think that the, those infrastructures, those digital infrastructures, should be part of a more holistic way to think about economic development and the way you develop. I mean, it, it cannot just be a just a kind of infrastructure that comes from abroad and that fits, because you have to be able to link it in the way that you, your institutions work. Because at the end, those data, those infrastructures are gonna be about how you reorganize your healthcare system, how you reorganize your schooling, how you reorganize like government services and, acts and financial access and all these things. And that's why I insist that those questions, uh, they are, political question, first of all, and that they are, they are questions about what kind of model are we shaping up. So they cannot just, okay, you know, we're just going to wait for some infrastructures to come. I think, I think that's why, well, we know that there is a lack of connectivity and so on, but basically that's why, for example, now Europe is investing so much in digitization because we understand that this has to be done, but it has to be linked to the way we develop society. So that's why I'm not so negative, I mean, I know that you could say you're losing this because it's obvious that digitization is going in a very different way and there is no space for 
this third way, yes, not like the, but I think not really because we're just at the beginning, but we are starting now to embed technology into all the institutions of society. And I think this is not by chance that Europe is thinking about it first, because without our social model, without our social market economy, without our um, basically democratic model, also our democracy will disappear. So we have to think about it, how we do it now. And for me, the only way will be, do it, will be to do it in that way, so value-based and to, and to, and maybe it seems slower because we are regulating, but it's not slower. We are setting the foundation for something that needs to, to develop, um, linked to our choices of how we want to live in the future. That's just coupling the technology back with those kind of broader questions. Thank you, Francesca.